Deakin University would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the unceded lands, skies and waterways on which our students and staff come together as we learn, teach, innovate and research through virtually and physically constructed places across time, we pay our deep respect to the elders and ancestors who have cared for the country that you join us from. An ancient place where education, innovation and knowledge transfer have taken place for many thousands of years. At Deakin, we aim to nurture and continue this important legacy whilst encouraging our communities to walk softly on country in the spirit of sustainability. In particular, we give gratitude to the elders and ancestors of Wadawurrung country, Wurundjeri country, and Eastern Ma country and beyond, where our physical campuses are located. Their contributions to our learning communities and environments are rich and highly valued. Deakin is committed to embedding indigenous knowledges and perspectives in all disciplines that we teach, as well as advancing the self-determined interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including treaty and truth-telling. As you move around our physical and virtual environments, take a moment to consider, appreciate and listen deeply to the country beneath your feet. Hello, hi, Wamanjika, welcome. My name is Kate Mannell. I'm a research fellow at Deakin University in the Centre of Excellence for the Digital Child. And it is my absolute pleasure to be hosting this event today on behalf of the Digital Child Centre. If you haven't uh, come across us before, the Digital Child Centre's mission is to create positive digital childhoods for every child in Australia by researching three core areas, children's health, education and connections. Um, and there's a few colleagues from the centre here today, so if you want to find out more, please grab someone and, and have a chat. I want to acknowledge uh, that those of us who are in the room today are, are on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, sitting here on the banks of the Birrarung River, uh, and pay my respects and our respects to elders past and present. I also want to thank all of you for taking time to join us, those of you who are in the room, but also those online. We have a pretty hearty uh, contingent in the Zoom room, so welcome to you. Um, I also want to note that this is an, is an event that ostensibly is about trying to centre the experiences of parents, particularly parents of young children, um, but it is on at a time that is traditionally not hugely convenient for parents. Um, so if you do have to duck out or you have to duck out online to uh, wrangle a child, um, I just want to let you know that this is being recorded. The recording will be available afterwards um, so you can catch up again later. I also want to say thank you to the Digital Child Centre, to ACME uh, and to my colleague Loretta for the support in putting this event together. And of course thanks also to our panellists um, who have generously given their time to come and be here. Before we kick off, I also just want to very quickly give you uh, a sense of the kind of running order for this evening so that you know where we're heading. I'm going to start off by giving some brief comments to kind of contextualise the panel discussion that's going to follow. I'll then invite our wonderful panellists to come and join me for that conversation. Um, towards the end of that, we'll open up for some Q&A, including um, for those of you who are joining us online as well. So please do feel free to contribute some questions into the chat. That will take us through to about 6.30, where um, Professor Julian Sefton-Green, who's one of the chief investigators at the Digital Child Centre, is going to offer some concluding thoughts. After which uh, we will have all earned a little snack and a drink, so we'll wrap up the kind of programmed proceedings there um, and have some refreshments and hopefully carry on some conversations uh, in a more kind of informal manner. So before I invite up our panellists, I want to take a few minutes just to lay out some kind of context and framing and, and start to try to chart a direction for um, the conversation that we're going to have. Two months ago, the US Surgeon General issued a public health advisory about the impact of modern stresses on parents' mental health. This advisory is essentially the US Surgeon General sounding an alarm that parents in the US are not okay, that the level of stress that many parents are facing is seriously impacting them and their families, of course, including their children. 
Some of the causes that that advisory points to are relatively distinct to the US, so a lack of family support policy, uh, in particular lack of parental leave. But it also points to some causes um, that are around cultural issues, which in many ways also apply here and in other kinds of similar countries. And so the advisory calls for shifts in norms around raising children. There's a range of these different kind of cultural challenges that the Surgeon General identifies, including parenting in a context where the future is very uncertain, and in a context where parenting has become a very time intensive activity, and expectations around children's achievement have increased. These kinds of observations are supported by a lot of historical and sociological research that has charted the rise in what it terms intensive parenting. This is essentially the idea that raising children has become a much more resource intensive activity, time, money, labor, so on. At the same time, that it has also become much more the sole responsibility of parents as opposed to a responsibility that's more broadly shared. What does any of this have to do with screen time? What a weird place to start. Um, I actually think that this advisory from the Surgeon General is a helpful illustration of the kind of framing that I want to bring to this conversation. Young children's use of screen media is a topic where parents can feel a lot of pressure, they can feel judgment, they can feel guilt, maybe even shame. And I want to try to take that really seriously, particularly given this broader context where expectations around what's involved in raising a child have become so heightened. There's a lot of talk about kids and screens or digital technology more broadly, but I think there's much less talk about what that means for parents, and this is what I'm hoping we're going to grapple with um, this evening. I want to note that we have seen some improvement in the kind of conversation around young children and screens. For a very long time, the public health advice to parents in this area was focused very much on giving time limits that are based on a child's age, so no screen time for under twos and so on. This has started to shift, um, partly due to a pushback against the lack of evidence to support specific time-based, uh, age-based time limits, partly in recognition that of course there's more to children's screen use than just time. There's also questions of content, what is a child doing, what are they looking at, and what is the context, what is the context, or the environment around that, the rest of the child's day, so on and so forth. And also part of the pushback against these um, guidelines has been the fact that no one could um, meet them anyway. So there have been a few examples of significant organisations updating these guidelines in response to these shifts and trying to take a much more flexible approach that accounts for the specific circumstances of a child, of a family, of different types of screen use. Despite this though, my own sense is that a lot of the discourse around children and screens is still very dominated by quite a kind of limited and dogmatic set of ideas. The Australian guidelines, for example, are still only concerned with time limits because they're situated with an advice about physical activity. I'm also doing a project as part of my work at the Digital Child Centre, which is looking at um, discourse around young children's screen time um, in places like TikTok parenting advice, videos and news reporting. And what I found through that research is a lot of very intense, very emotive, very rigid advice about children's screen time, often framed in very high stakes terms around harms. There's a lot of very conflicting advice and there's a lot of women with perfect hair talking about their kind of no screen time households. Um, I've also done a lot of work reviewing research around children's digital media use and have been quite frustrated by the amount of quite poor quality research that gets a lot of media attention. And so I guess my point is that my hunch is that all of this is not particularly helpful for parents. So that's where I want to focus our discussion this evening. Where is the conversation at around children and screens? To what extent does this conversation connect to parents' actual concerns and experiences? To what extent does it create new anxieties and pressures that maybe wouldn't be there otherwise? And how can we have some better conversations that meet parents where they're at and that take into account this wider landscape that I've tried to point to of contemporary parenting where a lot is being asked of parents. So with that, I'm going to invite our wonderful panellists, Billy, Fiona and Dan, to come up and join me and we will kick off. Oh, you want me at the end? Okay. One moment. We have to wait. <laughs> Great. Um, 
I could not be more delighted to be welcoming and introducing our um, panellists for today. Furthest away from me on the end there we have Fiona Holder. Fiona is an early years facilitator and disability advocate. She's the program coordinator at Playgroup Victoria and for the past five years has also been facilitate, facilitating Playgroup Plus Play Connect Plus playgroups, which are designed for children with additional needs. Fiona is also a mum to three children with autism and a range of other diagnoses, and she draws on this lived experience to support children with disabilities, developmental delays, and chronic illnesses together with their families. Next to Fiona, we have uh, Dr. Billy Garvey. Billy is a dad, a podcaster, an author, and a developmental paediatrician with over 20 years' experience working with children and families in a number of settings. He's also the founder of Guiding Growing Minds, a social enterprise that's dedicated to the future of our kids. Across these various roles, Billy's work is focused on helping those who care for kids, whether that's parents, educators, sports coaches, clinicians, or so on, by advancing their ability to guide healthy child development and mental health. And uh, next to Billy, we have Daniel. Donahue. Daniel is the Digital Innovation Manager at Project Rocket, where he oversees the development of resources uh, and services for students, teachers and parents. Daniel works at the intersection of play, technology and learning and has designed uh, alternate reality games, worked with top educational app designers and supported um, education and learning teams at Lego, Disney and Apple. He's also a father of four boys and the author of two books on parenting, Idolising Children and Ad Proofing Your Kids. So a brilliant kind of range of expertise uh, and experience to bring to this conversation. Thank you so much for uh, coming along and, and joining me. Before we kind of jump into the weeds, I want to start with this term screen time itself, um, because I've gone back and forth a lot on whether or not to use it in, in this event. Um, in my own research context, it doesn't really get used anymore, partly because it's very vague. Even researchers can't decide what counts as screen time. And it also has that pesky word time in it, which kind of contributes to that overemphasis on time that a lot of researchers are trying to get away from. On the other hand, though, Screen time is still commonly used as a term in a lot of other research, um, and it's kind of common vernacular. It's language that people often use when they talk about kids and technology, kids and, and, and screen use. So I want to ask two questions. Where does this term screen time come from? And Dan, I think you're happy to talk to that. And then maybe um, for Billy and Fiona, in the context of the, own, of the work that you do with families, is this a term that comes up, that gets used? And do you see that as an issue, or is the language that we use actually not that important here? Thanks, Kate. Um, can I just say, too, as a sort of starting point, too, like within the context of parenting and those who support parents and do that kind of work, the ability to talk about the concept of worrying about whether or not your child is spending too much time on the screen is an extremely privileged thing, really. Like, when we're not... We're in a certain space when we talk about these things, and I just think we should sort of think about that when we have these conversations too. Um, I didn't think I'd still be here in 2024 having a, this sort of conversation. I've been in the... I'm probably talking about the concept of screen time for 20-odd years. Um, I think its origins really go back properly in terms of the policy space and the way we're even talking about it today to around 1992 when the American Association of Pediatricians first developed their first model for a screen time policy. Um, and that's where that model of no screen for children under the age of two, half an hour for one to two, one hour, that, that was the bedrock for that kind of thinking. Um, and they have a media and, 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 and sort of group of paediatricians that, that sort of think about those things and make those issues. And then they reviewed that again in 1999 and 2004 and 2011. And the landscape had changed from like households with one or two televisions, a black and white one in parents' bedroom and the other one in the main living area, through to, you know, by 2011 we were talking about iPads and all of these kinds of things, and we all were carrying around screens in our pockets and households had, you know, well-off households had a whole range of different screens. And it was at then at that point that around, they had one of the members of that committee, Dr. Dimitri Christakis, sort of wrote a piece for the JAMA Pediatrics Journal where he talked about the fact of like, oh, maybe it's changed a little bit. Maybe the way children are interacting with these things that are iPads and tablets and those kinds of things means we have to rethink this a little bit. And the American Association of Pediatricians put out a, a piece, I think it was around 2014 and 2016. They sort of reviewed the policy 
And one of the lines they ran with was, we, have to, we can no longer rely on the precautionary principle. We have to actually use evidence based and science, which means to say that the concept of screen time and the way we've been thinking about it and the way it's entered the public consciousness since 1992 was based on the Hippocratic Oath of like, do no harm. <laughs> and so therefore, and, and my suggestion was, at that time when I was doing some writing for some different groups was that, well, actually it did do harm. Because if you're a PhD student in the late 90s and you were wanting to explore how parents and children would understand the internet together or how young children could watch television and play computer games with parents and what that would look like, there would be very few institutions that would allow you <laughs> to do that because an ethics committee would just look at that sort of standard from the American Association of Pediatricians that had been adopted by departments of health in Britain and Australia and other Western nations and be like, well, we can't. And so we sort of have had this vacuum over a really long period of time. Why the, why the center of excellence for the digital child is so important is there just is a vacuum of evidence. There's a vacuum of understanding. Um, and the fact that we continue to use screen time baffles me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All I heard was it's all paediatricians' fault. <laughs> the American paediatricians, Billy. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> so, no, but it, it's interesting about the guidelines because, yeah, we, I did a talk maybe 10 years ago. I remember I, the only reason I remember is I had three talks. I had to do PD on severe behavioural difficulties in kids at the RCH where I work. I then went to the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and spoke to teachers, and then I went to the South Bank Library. I spoke to teachers about... Um, neurodiversity and then I went and spoke to the public about child and mental health and through the day I was the talks were getting easier because the pediatricians like I know everything and then the educators wanted to learn and the teachers were like how can we help and I remember I had a slide up that just had the title screen time and this dad stood up in the middle of the audience and was like we are so sick of being screen shamed and I'll never forget it thank god what I went on was about how useless screen time is and the joke is you know that the guidelines say that zero to two is no time, two to five is one hour, and above five, two hours max. And the joke is that the research shows that 90% of people aren't compliant with that, and 10% of people lie about how compliant yeah. they are. <laughs> it's so difficult. Like, at the moment, my three-year-old will be on a screen so that her mum can make her dinner, so that I can do this talk. Like, we're all just trying to function, yep. and I think it's a really important frame, and I, yeah. I know Fiona will speak to this as well, from a really good perspective of, like, how do we actually do this in a way that understands the evidence around child development, but also looks at our kids and thinks, actually, how are they going? You know, and that's what I do. My daughter gets her hair brushed every night watching Spider-Man cartoons. It doesn't mean that she struggles to fall asleep. Sleep hygiene would say that's a bad move. If she struggled to fall asleep because of doing that, we would stop doing it because we would watch her and how she's going. Like, it's, a, it's interesting nuance, and I agree with you. It's crazy that we still talk about it, but I think it's because simple messages are easier to pick up about not doing this. And then the risk is that there's so much shame around it, and a lot of the evidence shows us that how good you are as a parent is determined by how good you are you feel, how good you feel you are as a parent. Yeah. And so we've got to remember that if ourselves are feeling shameful about using screens or we're unintentionally shaming other people, we risk that we're really damaging how they feel about in terms of how they're going and that's probably a good point for you to talk to some of your experiences. Yes, yeah, so the families that I work with, uh, Kate has mentioned, I, I help to support children um, and families with disability, uh, developmental delays and chronic illness. So the term screen time, we actually don't use it in my space at work um, and the reason for that is because the screen actually plays a really integral role um, in speech development in a lot of cases but also when you've got a child that's dysregulated um, or perhaps burnt out um, sometimes the screen can actually be very very helpful in terms of them calming down and taking the time they need in order to be able to re-engage um, in an activity or re-engage with their family so um, I try to actually build parents' capacity to, um, I guess, step away from the word shame and, and, and those screen time shames that come with it because the screen actually plays an integral part in the day-to-day -day of the family running of the, of the children that I work with. I think that's probably the best way 
to describe. And, and I am a mum of kids with disability um, and, and it certainly plays a huge part in my children's life. And I agree exactly with what you said. My kids um, are in the city tonight so that I can be here and they were on tablets on the way here just so they could survive the next couple of hours mm. out and about while I'm here tonight. Mm. So... Um, and, and, and something I said earlier, I actually don't use screen time. It's never been a currency in my house. I don't use it as um, a reward. I also don't use it as, um, if there is a consequence, perhaps for a poor choice, I, I, the tablet does not play a part in that because it actually has a much bigger function at my house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So what I'm hearing is that screen time has a bit of baggage as a, as a term <laughs> uh, and maybe kind of oversimplifies or flattens um, some of the complexity that's involved in screen use, which I'm sure is something we'll get into more. Um, so I'll, the audience can like, just apply square, scare, scare quotes like whenever we use the term screen time. Um, in, my, in my kind of introduction there, I painted quite a probably bleak picture of discourse around young children and screen time. And you've all spoken now to, to where your kind of own perspectives are at, but I want you to, to tell us a little bit about how you see the kind of messaging that's, that's available to parents or being directed at families at the moment around children and, and screen use. Is it kind of as crappy as I've suggested? Is it better than that? How, how do you see it from, from your perspectives? Oh, I can jump in if you like. I think it is pretty damaging. I think families have enough to manage anyway without feeling shame and pressure around, you know, um, screen usage at their own home. And I think we talked about it a bit earlier as well. I, I think each family runs completely differently and it would be pretty remiss to actually try and have a cookie cutter approach to screen times as well. Um, and I, I think parents now, you know, there's lots of pressures and, you know, most parents, both parents are working and you're doing lots of things. And I think to add one more level of shame to guilt that you're probably carrying anyway, it just isn't helpful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've got the privilege of meeting a lot of kids in clinic um, and I learn a lot from them and it guides my own parenting mm. probably more than the research does, to be honest. Um, yeah, and the interesting thing is I meet a lot of kids who, you know, screens allow them to be creative, they allow them to connect. I meet a lot of autistic kids that the only friendships they have are ones that are online. I agree. And I would never take that away from them and I would reinforce it actually because they're learning social skills, it's securing their self-esteem, it's doing all these amazing things. And yeah, I convinced my partner about eight years ago that I needed to buy, buy Fortnite because all the kids realised I didn't know what I was talking about. And I've actually got so much credibility in clinic now outside of that. And I literally on my to-do list is to start playing Minecraft because they see right through me when I'm like, are you You can winning? join my server, it's okay. <laughs> but it's an important thing. It's this opportunity of connection, including with it's our true. kids. Like I, my daughter literally could not, we could not brush her hair three months ago. And for some reason, some kid at, <laughs> which is great, but some kid at daycare has convinced her that Spider-Man's cool and now she only wears Spider-Man clothes, has a Spider-Man outfit, everything like that. And now it's a positive experience brushing her hair. She sits in my lap, we watch Spidey and her mum brushes her hair. And it's just, I get an hour a day at the most with her and that's part of it. And it's gone from a terrible moment to one that's nice because of a screen and because of that. So I think it's really important we think about that. And I think it's like, as much as I'm joking, how do we share those spaces with kids? Because we also need to know what they're watching, what they're doing, what they're seeing, how they feel about it, making sure they can come to us, we can talk to them. Because all of us, like you guys are already in this space, but this is how you learn about social media. This is how you learn about you know, consent. This is how you learn about how to navigate that space. It's like learning to drive a car. If we just ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, and then go, here, your keys, good luck, see ya. Like we don't, we talk about it and we show them. It's like learning how to ride a bike. We help them learn and when they fall down, they come to us, we celebrate them, like all of that stuff. There's, there's gonna be no conflict on this panel if that's what you were looking for because <laughs> um, at Project Rocket, the parenting sessions that we run are really called Parenting in a Digital World. The game because it's so much more than just a screen, mm -hmm. right? It's it's. And, and, and the focus, again, is, is broadly on that idea of, of, like you were saying, Billy, like we often talk about blocking or limiting time, all the rest. All these, like, a lot of it's built around safety. Mm. We have a commissioner of e-safety, right? But, you know, the biggest protective factor as a parent for your child is the relationship that you have with them. Mm. You know, when you say, come to us, 
that's one of the key messages that we send in the thing. It's like, you don't want to use technology as the bad guy because as your children grow, and, and we do a lot of work with older primary school and secondary school's children, it's like, if your child has a problem, you want them to come to you, right? And if they think you're going to be angry or they think you're going to take your phone away or their tablet or not let them have access to the computer, they're not going to come to you. Mm -hmm. So you actually need to find a way when you're parenting children in this environment now that has all these devices to somehow quieten the noise around people who just want to take that diametrically opposed technology, good, bad. It's, it's not. It's a thing that's there that we need to spend time with and work with. And, and so I think that's, that's the thing that, I th again, I, I understand it's a simple idea and all the rest of it, but in work that I did a few years ago with the Alana Madeline Foundation during the pandemic and we went in, we, we, we sort of put all these families into a Facebook group and said, hey, can we ask you provocations and can you capture what life's like at home in lockdown with all of these screens and all the rest of it? And, and put, it was really interesting. When we codified that data, there was very little talk of screen time and everyone talked about scrolling. Like there's a shared understanding that there's an experience of technology that is productive and useful and beneficial and then there's a time when it's not. Yeah. Um, the young people that I work with at our National Youth Collective call it bed rot um, or bed rotting. <laughs> Um, and that's that point where we all have, where we're just sort of aimlessly scrolling and feeling like it's, it's got beyond being good for us. Mm. Mm. Um, and it seemed to be the families in that project could agree on that. And they weren't all talking with each other either. These concepts were coming from, mm -hmm. you know, far north Queensland and Adelaide. And mm. so my thinking is, is that, yes, that wherever those messages around the simplicity of a message of screen time are coming from, they're not beneficial or useful for parents. They are the shaming device. Yeah, they are. And it offers no value. Yeah. You know, yeah. it doesn't offer any doesn't information. doesn't help you be a better no, parent. No, absolutely. I want to just yeah. ask a quick kind of follow-up follow question here. Like, to what ex So you, you've kind of shared, you know, your you've suggested that you do still see that there is some kind of unhelpful commentary or some very black and white or some very talking about harms. But I want to try and get a little bit more at the sense of like, to what extent do you think that's still dominating the conversation? So the, the views that you've shared, you know, it's, it's great for a, for a um, paediatrician to learn about Fortnite so that I can work with my clients or whatever. Uh, do you feel like those are still kind of, um, those the views and perspectives that each of you have shared are still counter to the kind of dominant Oh yeah, most you? of my colleagues would disagree with me about the way that I approach this stuff. Like, and I'm not saying it's not harmful. Like, there are von there's a vulnerability in it. Just like the that's a really good point. The passive versus active views. We see kids that are active. They're contributing. It's a creative outlet. It's social connection. And then all of us. Like, the more stressed I am, the more I've got on. The more times in an hour I'll pick up my phone and check stuff. You know, but that's a symptom of me struggling with something. And it's the same. If I meet a kid in clinic who was playing sports or used to spend time with dad or was attending school, we're still seeing kids every week who haven't gone back to school since the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, it's true. You know, and, and they're on screens a lot. That's a symptom that a kid is struggling. Just, mm. you know what I mean? And it's not mm. a point of, well, take the screen away from yeah. them. It's address why they're struggling mm. because their self-esteem is insecure. They have suicidal thoughts. They're self You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's silly to just, like you said, Dan, like, just take it away and be like, well, you've stopped going to school or you've stopped playing sports or whatever. I'm just going to take this away from you. And it's, yeah, it's a very primitive approach to supporting kids that are struggling. Mm -hmm. hey, I Did you want to talk at all, Fiona, to what those kind of dominant messages are? Yeah, look, like, in the space within, I, in the space that I work within, sorry, um, I... I don't allow it to actually be the dominating mm -hmm. um, level of discussion because I, I am in the business of trying to build capacity within families and I actually don't think allowing that to actually take the lead is actually helpful to them. Do you think you're unusual in that? Um, maybe. Um, I, I think the fact that I have lived experience to support it is probably very helpful for my approach. I mean, we were just chatting before I was chatting with Dan, actually. Um, one of my boys wasn't going to engage in an activity, and, and I found that the iPad has been particularly useful if I um, his anxiety is such that he can't engage in things unless he knows every last little bit about them. So. Being able to research, being able to show him a footprint of something, being able to really let him immerse himself into a space before he's able to go into it has meant that he can leave the house, has meant that he can, you know, he also has medication for his anxiety. But 
it is built his capacity. So I, I will never um, mm. be on the... I agree with what you were saying before, though. I also, you do have to watch the content, and as children get older, you have to yeah. be pretty savvy with understanding technology. But in the early years, as a tool in order to support children, for whatever reason it is, um, why wouldn't we embrace that and support it and, and, and then, yeah, look to the root of what the problems are? But I think you are unique. Children. You've given that to me, standing there and you set it up here. It's not a currency in our house. That's and it a, never has been. Yeah, that's, I've never heard that said before. And I've spoken about screens like... But you know what? And I can tell my kids it's time to go to bed now. No worries, we'll charge, put my iPad on the charge. It, it's never... No one's sneaking an iPad at our place. No one's... Um... Yeah, and totally. And there'll be people in the audience, and I've gone through that window, where they really struggle to come off devices. We see a lot of those kids, yeah. but it's a skill, isn't it? And yeah. It's a skill that you've probably quite innately taught to your kids. They've been in a house for mm. a long time. So my, my twins got their first device when they were three as a speech device. Um, we were mortified, to be perfectly truthful. It wasn't something we thought would happen. Um, and, you know, they're on to their third device now and there's been a progression in the, the style of device they have. But the new iPad 10 actually recognises probably 98% of the time my child's speech impediment. So he can voice to text anything um, or, you know, voice search on Google for information. He knows lots of facts. He wouldn't have all of that if it yeah. weren't for the device. Yeah. Oh, and also, like, I benefit. We've got a... Nearly 10,000 people listened to our pod uh, podcast yesterday. Like, we were two weeks ago, we were the 10th biggest podcast in the country, and R Joe Rogan was 11th. Wow. So I was very proud of that. But that's because of screens. Yeah. Like, people have found that thanks to Instagram. Like, that's yeah. a community. And it's funny. Instagram, like, I bradbury it to about 70,000. I have no social media skills. And then a, a consultancy came over, or Ivy Street, to manage it pro bono. But initially, there was hostility sometimes in that group, and I would have to monitor it. I almost don't have to do anything now yeah. because it's this beautiful community, and the Pop Culture Parenting Podcast community is the best thing about that podcast, mm -hmm. and it exists because of screens and because people can access information and others. The culture is still, like, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but to, to address that point, it is still dominant, though. Like, and maybe that's what it's on. It's like... This is not what most of the conversation. No, no, no. The Senate, like, like right? I, I will... I will go into childcare centres. I will. I will have worked with maternal and child health nurses. Um, there are still teachers that are like, "Oh, phones in classrooms are, are no good," and we've got the whole phone ban sort of thing going on across schools and all the rest of it. And I think collectively as a culture, like I think that's why again this idea of the centre of the digital child is an interesting thing because we haven't got a modern idea of what is childhood. We've taken all the ideas of what childhood is. I remember talking to people once about digital apps and a group of masters of education at Melbourne University and talking to them. And I was showing them an app and saying, oh, this one's been inspired by Montessori. And I actually had an audience heckle me in a lecture <laughs> saying, oh, that's, don't you dare bring Montessori into this, right? But if you think about who Maria Montessori was as an educationalist and what she wanted to explore about how children experience the world and what they would, I think your Montessori's and your Piaget's would be wrapping their head around this technology as constructivists going, oh my God, mm -hmm. this is amazing. What can we do with this? And yet we hark back to, to golden times <laughs> and don't move forward to say, well, what does it look like now? What does it look like for children to be facing climate anxiety and to be dealing with the world that we are leaving them? And, then at the, and to be dealing with a world where we know statistically we've created a, an idea of things being so unsafe that children are spending far less time outside, less time independently, and so they come inside to go on screens and we say, oh, they're not safe either. Don't go on those. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a strange collective thinking around how we think about children today. I want to use that as a way of, of kind of shifting to thinking about the, the bind that all of this puts parents into and, and the kind of experiences of parents in this in this context. So we have this environment where um, there, as we've, as we've kind of gestured to, there's still a lot of conversation that's dominated by very kind of rigid ideas, you know, one size fits all, here's the amount of time um, it's going to ruin your kid's brain. But we also have voices like, like yours and the messaging that you um, have, have described bringing into your work as well. Um, and so I, I want to ask a question, maybe particularly for Billy and Fiona, in terms of the work that you do that's, that's very, you know, focused, like working directly with families. What kinds of concerns do they have? Do they bring concerns around? To, is it something that comes up in playgroup or in clinic? Because I'm trying to get at this question of, like, is there a mismatch between the conversation that's happening 
and the actual experience of parents. Are they, are they worried about the things that we're talking about? Are, they, are their worries being generated by the conversation that we're having? Is there a kind of disconnect there between the, the, the conversation around screen time and the experience of families? Or are families bringing a lot of concerns around this topic? Yeah, yeah. I, so I've got a girl I'm seeing in clinic at the moment who um, was bullied so severely online that all the kids got together and beat her up so badly. She was hospitalised. She was 14 when that happened. Um, it happened to her again six months later. She left the school and it followed her because of online bullying and she got beaten up again by another girl, group of girls. Um, and her mum didn't finish high school, has mental illness, is a single parent. Um, this kid has neuro disability and other things, you know, that make it really hard learning stuff and all these things. And mum's approach, understandably, is, well, she just can't have a social media profile. That's how I'll protect her. When the reality is the entire community should have protected her, mm. not the lack of, you know, not bullying online. And this is the problem with this zero tolerance crap that, like, exists. We'll just put posters up and we'll have a zero tolerance to bullying. Like, bullying is a symptom of a community that is not healthy. It is not, like, I've said this lately and it really pisses some people off. The evidence shows us that kids that get expelled from schools, the school that does that is worse for the kids that stay because they have primitive mechanisms to deal with a kid who is struggling. And that's the discourse needs to shift away from like, get off screens, get out of social media, stop playing video, you know, video games. And it's like what you're talking about. The outdoor community is lost. Like we, we grew up running around and it doesn't happen anymore. And it's not because our parents were any better than us. It's just because the world has changed. Mm. And so people want to seek community and these teenagers, I've got a parent that had to convince to let their kid have a social media account. So he didn't have a single friend, he was a gorgeous, like sociable boy. He lived rurally and he, I was like, well, do you have any friends? Like, yeah, at school. Well, we always ask, do you see them outside of school? Never, because mm -hmm. of how far away they live. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. You're really sociable and really nice. And you remember to ask me questions about my kids. I couldn't do that when I was your age. But it's because of his parents' social media approach that he doesn't have any friends. Like he's not having social opportunity. So it's a really important thing. And I think, yeah, I've got swept up in some stuff about like these rules and bans and all this stuff. but. We're missing an opportunity to have healthier communities by looking at that when we should be looking at what's actually going on. Would it be fair to say then that, that you see in clinic examples where um, parents bring a lot of fear and anxiety to this issue that doesn't necessarily come out of observing something that's happened with their child and social media, but that they come with a kind of fear and anxiety that's shaping how they approach it from the start. Totally. So we're all looking for levers, aren't we? Like, you know, I'm looking for a lever. My 15-month-old son isn't talking and I'm like racked with guilt because I'm like, it's because I don't have any time with him. And it's, you know, I'm sitting there like having a coffee, like giving him as many words as I can in the 20 minutes I get with him in the morning. But, you know, and I'm looking at that stuff. But the reality is all of us are looking at that stuff. We just, we haven't given the world better tools to connect with their kids. That's the actual problem is no one's taught them. Like, it's a weird thing that we are focused on speech and we're focused on walking and mm. riding a bike and all mm. this stuff. But emotional and social skills mm. have all the same components to them. But because people can't conceptualize it, but it's wild. If you think about how much time like men spend getting their handicap better and money and everything at golf, they care way more about their kids, but they think it'll magically just happen, that relationship and supporting them and all that stuff. And it's, that's the hard thing. Like a third of parents in this country on an, on an RCH poll said that a third said that mental health problems in kids are best left alone. Like that's really, really? worrying because those are all the vulnerable kids. Yeah, we did yeah. it like maybe maybe right before the pandemic. I think it was 2021 maybe. But yeah, like that's it's disturbing. really disturbing. And so that's the thing that <laughs> I can sense your frustration of like, I can't believe I'm still talking about this, mm. but I think it's because it's an easy lever to understand and be mm. like, I can move that. But I think you're like in the work that I do, like the parents that come to our sessions that work with us, like the, you know, the joke I make often, and I really appreciate you talking about the bullying story with the level of complex needs there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that child that's not, Yes, it was social media and bullying, but there obviously were a range of complex stuff going on in that child's life that needs a whole range of supports and sophisticated yeah. ways around it. But I often joke when parents come, like, well, your child will be fine. You've, you've 
given up an hour or two on a Tuesday night to come and have a listen to a chat. Like, that's that's sort of the indicator from my perspective. But they're worried about the battlegrounds. They're actually worried about their relationships mm. with their children and how they're emerging. And people see that technology or screens are in the way of that relationship. And so, therefore, I think mm. that, 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 that dominant culture mm. of like, oh, screen time, oh, if I just reduce the amount of screen, the relationship will be better. Mm. And that's not what it is. Like, at Project Rocket, with our parents, we talk about the fact that it, the same thing we talk to students that we do school workshops with, it's sort of like saying, well, what do you value? What's important to you? So there's all these like family technology plans and things. And the first question of that plan should be, what do you enjoy doing together as a family? Yeah, go on. We yeah. enjoy going to the, not, not how long do you think you should spend on the screen and where should screens be kept? Yeah. It should be like, oh, we all enjoy walking our dog. Or gee, don't we love the footy? Let's prioritize those things. And then the relationship and even the screen time, if that's still what you're worried about, takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but I can see that, and, and I, th I don't think enough people are, that's why the dominant paradigm of an easy out of if you just get two hours or if your child just spends less time, the relationship will improve. So I think, yeah, I think parents are being sold a furphy. Yeah, totally. I, 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 I want to um, ask you something actually. But before I say that, you're just funny talking about the relationship because my partner is an obstetrics doctor and he was doing this run of doing like 84 rostered hours a week on night shift. And I was like, Charlie my, was one at the time, wasn't <laughs> sleeping. And I was so exhausted. <laughs> I was watching TV just to try and wind down and he wouldn't sleep and I couldn't settle him. And so I was just like, and I just sat him next to me and I was like, I'm okay with this. And I was like, I'm not kidding. I thought for a second whether I needed to change it from Godzilla because I was watching Godzilla. <laughs> I was like, maybe that's not right for a one-year-old, but actually... Maybe Bluey. <laughs> yeah. But it was this time when I was with him, you know what I mean? And that's, that's a hard thing. I see a lot of dads that, you know, are doing a lot of stuff. I have dads that come into clinic and just sit on their phone the whole time and mum's telling me all the stuff they're worried about. Like, that's what I'm interested about hearing you talk to because I was brought up in Frankston by a single mum, like... You know, she yeah. wasn't coming to a parenting talk. She wasn't reading a parenting book or a parenting no. podcast, listening no. to one. So how do we get to them? Is you know, and obviously your work does this and your work does this, Dan, but how do we get to them en masse? Like Oh look, honestly, I don't know. I, I work with a very tiny group of parents, but I think certainly this kind of discussion is certainly very, very helpful. Um I <laughs> I think single mums are doing a brilliant job on hats off to them because I honestly couldn't do it without, you know, the help of my husband. So I, I think, you know, adding one more level of shame with a screen is absolutely the furthest thing from helpful in that particular space. Um, it's, it's quite interesting and maybe maybe I am a, a, an anomaly I guess in this space but I don't make it an issue with the families that I work with I really try to empower parents to your journey is big anyway um, and anything that you can to try and lighten your load to actually make the time that you actually need to advocate for your child or the time you get because they're all quality things for your child's development anyway Yes, spending one-on-one -on -one time with your child is really, really important, and I'm certainly not suggesting that you should ever take away from that, but everything that a parent does, and especially single mums, because they are the mum, the dad, they're in a lot of ways, they're the therapist as well, you know, you've got to be the friend too. I don't think adding shame for devices... Because I reckon you've got a good answer to this. What do you do when the parent's like, my kid won't get off the iPad? And I'm really worried about yeah, it. Yeah, so I, I talk a lot about transitional tools at that point, and we might talk about, you know, um, it depends on the age of the child. Flexibility is something, you know, I'll, I'll, mummy will be flexible, you know, this is... I try and actually give them words to talk about behaviours that they're actually doing day to day within things so that then when they need to, to get that from a child that they might be able to then resonate. Obviously with, you know, in the early years it's tricky and you sort of how much mud can you throw at a wall before eventually it sticks? I think that's a, a weird space, but I would, I, I'm, not in, I'm not in the business of taking tablets off kids. I haven't done it with my own and I certainly wouldn't tell a parent to do it, but if they're struggling with it, um, I would be looking at transition tools and, and I would be getting an OT to probably come in to, you know, to our sessions so that we can work with them uh, uh, in a holistic approach of 360 degrees with that family but it's not going to happen overnight I mean I hear it all the time about kids that are addicted to to screens or so their parents will tell you but are they I don't I mean I don't mine aren't are I see but I think there's and therein lies the problem like I 
I think actually something like the Centre for the Digital Child and the kind of level of research we're doing is it's not about reaching parents, it's actually about reaching professionals that are responsible for delivering these messages. And mm. we have a hell of a lot of parenting programs across the yep. country and PPP and, and sort of positive parenting and people out there doing it. So I think it's actually about building that evidence base to say, hey, the world's different now. Mm. And, and all the kinds of things that the digital child is learning and sharing about how these things work need to... And, and like you said, fine. And just because you're a paediatrician doesn't mean you're across this, right? Like you said, a lot of your colleagues oh, yeah, would not yeah. necessarily agree with you, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's also about saying, well, where are the spaces that we're actually supporting the sector to broadly support parents in a better way? That's, you've handed me the perfect segue to right. the last question <laughs> that I want to ask. Um, we will throw open <laughs> for questions in a second. But, but I want to get your thoughts on what all of this means for people who are in a position to kind of give advice to parents or to distribute information. And I am thinking here of researchers as an example of, of myself, of colleagues in the centre, maybe people who are making resources, maybe people who are support workers as well. Fiona, when we were chatting before, you used the word noise. You said there's a lot of noise mm. in this space, right? And it can be really hard for parents to kind of navigate that noise. And I was speaking at the start and trying to point to the fact that parents exist in this world where there's so much pressure on them. There's a lot going on. They're being given a lot of advice. They have a lot of other things to be worried about. So with all of that kind of context, what should we be aiming for in the way that we engage with parents around children's technologies so that we're not just more noise, more pressure, another person telling someone what they should or shouldn't be doing. I've, I'll come back to it again. I, I'm in the business of, well, I'm not in the business of it, but for me personally, and I can only speak to my own experience, but the families that I work to support, it's about building their capacity so that they can make executive choices to support their own children. And, and I think you know, there isn't a one approach suits all because it could be, you know, culturally the, you know, the demographic that you're working with, it could be spiritually that group of people that you're working with. I think everybody's own, I guess, parameters are different as well. So, you know, but for me, it's about breaking down the shame and just giving them the space to make choices that work for them in their own home. And I think staying across technology to the best of your ability, so as your child grows, your knowledge of what they're doing needs to grow with them. And I'm certainly navigating a strange space with my 13 year old, had that chat with Loretta earlier. <laughs> um, but I think so long as you, as they get older, as so long as you have an open line of communication with whoever it is that you're working with, um, be it your child or, or be it the families, I, I think it's about breaking down the stigma surrounding it and allowing people to parent their children the way they want to mm -hmm. with the supports in place to support that. I, no notes? I think, I, think, I think that means researchers but any professionals. Like I think humility goes a hell of a long way. I agree with that. And I'm really glad you didn't use the word uh, awesome, like parenting expert. It drives me absolutely mm. nuts because <laughs> I think that's a problem. People think they have an answer. Like that, that idea that I'm doing something that's going to save and work for all the children. It's like, well, actually, now have some humility. None of us, are, any one of us is going to have the actual answer. It goes back probably like community, like we all should, you know, the old proverb, it takes a child, village to raise a child. But it, like, that's the truth. Like, and we need to try and find ways to in, engage with that. And, and the community in the modern day is different. It is the Centre for the Digital Child. It is, you know, Project Rocket. It is the Royal Children's Hospital and Playgroups Victoria. And, and collectively, we should be collaborating more and working better together and not sort of drawing lines in the sand and be like, well, here's where you do this for when your child has mental health stuff with Headspace. And here's where you do this. It's like, no, actually, we We've got to recognise that, yeah, we need to collaborate and work together and have the humility to do that for parents and, and as in turn their children because they'll know them better than anyone. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's the next generation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Billy, what should we be aiming for? Yeah, I can try and be tight, which is I'm never that good at. But yeah. um, <laughs> Give it a go. So, yeah, one in seven kids in this country aged 4 to 17 years of age over a 12-month period has a clinical mental illness. For, like, and it splits even. 4 to 11 years of age, it's 13.6%. Everyone's like, it's just the teenagers. But we're, I met a kid in clinic this morning who has clinical anxiety that's five. Like, you know what I mean? I'm, we're, we're seeing this all the time. 
These are really vulnerable parents. And to be honest, I'm in a pretty privileged position because almost all the families I meet in clinic are help seeking. Yeah. But we should listen more to families instead of jumping into, I need to tell you about this. It's like the nutrition argument's the same. Everyone's like, this is how many vegetables a kid needs to eat. And everyone knows that. <laughs> It's just how. How do you get a kid to actually eat vegetables? Do yeah. you know what I mean? And there's actually heaps of evidence about that. It's just, it's so infuriating because the evidence is we provide the food at the time and what it is, they decide if they eat it. And you just want to tear your hair out <laughs> when they just decide not to eat it. <laughs> but that's the evidence, but they're pressure points. And screen time's the same. It's a pressure point that makes parenting really difficult. I also think, yeah, the truth, the, the, you say the truth, the evidence is in it. Positive childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences are abuse, neglect, household dysfunction. One in five kids in this country has three or more of them actively in their life. We all talk, we talk about developmental trauma as if it's a historic thing. All these kids are living it. And the positive childhood experiences that are the antidote to that and the protective factor are two non-parental adults that take a genuine interest in me, feeling like I participate in community traditions, feeling like I'm a valued member of my school community, one parent at home that feels, makes me feel safe, an adult I can talk to my, about my feelings and friends that I genuinely connect with. So we've got to think about that stuff and move away from the destructiveness of this. Mm. I had one final thing that I was going to bang on about, but I can't remember what it was now. Maybe you'll get lucky and yeah. someone yeah. in the audience will <laughs> ask you the, the, jog the, perfect, <laughs> get you there. the perfect question um, for you to come back to it. So we've got kind of about um, just under 10 minutes for some questions. So we'll open out um, to the floor. Someone has a microphone running around. We've also got... Um, Ooh, made just quickly, I realised, I remembered. It? Restorative practice. Restorative mm. practice has a place in this stuff. A lot of parents have heard negative stuff. We should call it out and say, how do we resolve how unhelpful all that messaging mm. has been for you? Mm. Sorry, that's it. Thank you. No, I think that's a really good point, yeah. actually. Thank you. There have been many indicators of uh, decline in youth mental health, such as self-harm, increasing suicide rates in the last 15, 20 years. And some people attribute that to social media, such as Jonathan Haidt in his book. Yeah. I think that's approximate explanation. Mm. The ultimate explanation, in my view, is the risk-averse parenting that this generation is engaging in for several reasons. Uh, they're having children later, uh, having fewer children, so they're creating the right treasures, and they don't want them to take any risks it is that which is contributing to this, in my view, rather than the social media. That is the ultimate explanation. So I would like your comment on that first question. Second question, if I may, is as a thought experiment, if you take a child, say five-year-old, and every day, let's say that you let the ch uh, child see four hours of movies only until they're 20. The second case, you let the child see only documentaries. Surely the second one is going to be more knowledgeable on how to cope with the world and so on. So as you said, it is the quality of what they watch that's important rather than the quantity. Thank you. I'll, uh, let, I'll I think let you, you choose your own adventure on this one and you can... Oh, can I just say one thing? I think you <laughs> underestimate the power of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, if you don't like those movies, your choice has been <laughs> fairly limited. I take, I, take, I take the point, though. Like, I don't know, like sometimes P Patricia Edgar used to say to me, who set up the Australian Children's Television Foundation, used to say that, you know, some television is really great for children, educational, all the rest of it, and some of it is um, really bad and harmful and, and a negative thing, but most of the time for most children it's just like, yeah, right? And I think that there's things about our Western knowledge systems that are problematic. I think those of you that are watching from Project Rocket, you're going to annoy, get annoyed that I'm going to say that I think the problem with the mental health crisis, not just in children, but in our society, is just living in late capitalism. Um, I, think, I think that actually, that was all I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, no, do you, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it was a good question. It was a mm. big question. Um, it's an interesting one because where I'm, the, the, 
the area that I'm placed is less about watching four hours of anything really and it's more about allowing a child to actually explore the universe that is. Um, and so I've got two of my children are only learning to read and write, they're 11 and a half, they've got mild intellectual disability and all of the facts that they have and they're so vast is because they Google everything and they absorb that knowledge. So I think, you know, so long, as, and we, we also, um, they don't just have free reign to go off to any old, you know, corner in the house and do this, you know, we're, we're monitoring what they're watching and what they're learning. But I think there is evidence to say that you certainly probably could, um, and I'm not the doctor here, so I probably shouldn't use the term evidence, but you know, it has certainly been proven with my children that they have the ability to learn from what they're, they're taking in and they have the ability to absorb it. Um, I also think there needs to be downtime. So if they want to watch a Disney princess, I don't know whether yes. I'd allow oh. for four hours, but you know, like, I mean, you have to allow downtime too. So whilst documentaries are great, I don't know any five-year-old that's going to probably want to sit and watch one, but I think it has to be a balance. And that's that's like with food and that's that's with play and with rest as well. It's all about the balance, I think, is what is important. But I guess that's what I'm saying about the capitalism thing. It's like, we don't value wasting time. Like, there's always something better we could be doing. You could all not be here and being reading Dostoevsky or something. Like, there's always something else that we could be doing better. And we live in a society that is putting pressure on both parents and, in turn, parents and put on their children that are like, you have to do all these activities. It has to be a bit of tennis. It has to be a bit of violin. It has to be this. It has to be that. And no one just says, hey, guess what? You can just be for a bit. And I actually think a down day, I say this to the families I work with, a down day is equally as important as all the other stuff that you do in your week because you still, your brain still needs a chance to rest. And like what about a down year? Like, what if we just stop doing that stuff and spend some time doing the thing that, yeah. that Billy's saying we should be doing, which is spending time with other children that aren't our children yeah. and fostering them and doing that. And sometimes that happens in sports clubs and all of those kinds of things, I know. But intent is very important. And I think our intent has lost its way because our intent is we will be better human beings and we'll be economically better off because we'll get better university courses and we'll get better jobs. I'm loving this expansive thinking, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rein it in, in so that we can, can get I, to can another I just question. Told you you there's, two, there's two parts to that question, and can I just very quickly... The, you, you're right. Like, the problem with the... It happened at the same time as social media problem is there's no, like, control group. There's no, like... You know, the, well, there is that island where, you know, the Christian people try and go there and they... Is there? Yeah, you know, where is it? It's off <laughs> India, where there's an island that they haven't seen technology. But you can't test that theory, can you? You can't actually test it. So it's easy to come out and write a book that says that. But you can't actually test that theory. And the best parent I saw last week lives in a house she's been squatting in for two years. She... Um, is getting hassled by every member of the government and police and everything. She's, I'm not kidding, she's got uh, two dogs, two cats, a macaw and four kids. And her house is the house that everyone comes to. She's like, the neighbours hate me because we have the parties here. But she's like, the kids in this neighbourhood need a safe place to come to where they can just be kids. Yeah. I was like, wow. And it, you know, she's getting evicted from this house and has trauma and everything. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like, what's that? And I, maybe if we have dead time later, I'd love to answer the parenting evidence question because there's a whole body of evidence on that about how do we actually parent our kids in an evidence-informed way. So I'm an occupational therapist and I work with lots of really little children and the parents often ask me, I don't know what to do about this screen time, I don't know what I can do, they won't do all the other things we need them to do. And I often ask, but the bit where it suddenly gets emotional is when I ask them how they feel about their own use of digital media. And I think that's why people get so emotional because deep, deep down in their gut they're not terribly happy with what they're doing themselves and then they're seeing actually my addiction for want of a better word my my attraction to my digital media is now rippling onto my children and I think that's where it gets really really tricky because when you're advising a, a family I would say people come and ask my opinion and then I put it back to them it, it's they just get overwhelmed and too hard because they've got to start with themselves just like every everyone does um, that, so that was sort of one point of why I think people get so emotional about it. Mm -hmm. um, the other point was, which you touched on was also the, the displacement of things by screens such as boredom. Yeah. I don't think I work with any children now that know or can tolerate 
boredom and I think it's cut off some other magic things that happen. Mm. So I'm interested in what you think about boredom and where it's gone. Yeah, I, I think you've got, you're using a great strategy clinically that I do too. I do it really, really gently, but introduce. And I, to be honest, I talk about myself. I talk about, I notice, I know how important role modeling is. And I know I'm a pretty poor role model when it comes to spending too much time on a screen, when I'm stressed and realizing that, and I need to address the stress, realizing that I'm always doing that. But yeah, my, my you know, 15 month old now just sees the phone and hands it to me. He doesn't hand toys to me. He sees the phone and he's like, you know, because you've always got that. And I, yeah, it, it does impact the quality of my time with my kids, but the answer is addressing the cause, you know, like the same as you, it's not about, well, it's about how do you create opportunities to connect with them. And the boredom thing, like I completely agree, that's, that's a thing that has, we've kind of, as a society, taken away from kids, which should be addressed. And our, yeah, mm. totally, and ourselves, yeah, I know, but you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, because we don't want to waste time. There's stuff to be done. But I love it that we're working in a family context. Like, I think that's a thing that I don't think happens enough. We're here talking about parents, and then we'll talk about children. Mm. Mm. But actually, there's not, probably not enough family context stuff going on. Great. Thanks. That was um, really interesting. I was going to ask you about your thoughts on privacy reform and the role that that might play in acting as a kind of protective mechanism for children online? I'm not I'm going to leave that one to you guys. I, I defer to the, sociolo uh, the sociologist Michael Waish from the University of Canvas, Kansas, who said we have to rethink a few things. And I think that we are in a point of time where governments and policymakers are struggling with technology that has radically changed our world and that I think I don't think that privacy legislation will be a protective kind of thing I think it's I think we actually have to rethink the whole concept of privacy itself mm -hmm. um, I think that privacy is not something that's existed for a very long time in human existence it's a very industrial revolution aged kind of concept and I think that it, it's an example of that I think if we want to I, I guess for me, it's relational. If we want to protect children and support children, it's, it's, it's a relational kind of thing, hence the family context and parenting in a way that means we value that above all else. Yeah, the, the privacy, it's a really good point because I think sometimes, you know, and there's this big thing, especially post-pandemic, that like, you know, the, the age legislation stuff is like this, you know, camouflaged way to get all of our details and like monitor our kids and all this stuff. and. I'm not sure the politicians are actually that clever, to be honest. I think they're just, you know, following what, where the loudest voices are coming from and they're often not people that are community-based at the coalface. I think, yeah, I, I agree with you. I actually think as a society and community, we need to expect better, like from some of the vulnerability that exists online around privacy. Like pornography is a really good example. Like we didn't grow up with that. It was the risk to our kids of seeing horrific content online now is huge. and. How will we protect them from that? It won't be privacy. I actually just had this discussion before I came up here today. Uh, you know, um, incognito windows. The, the ki you know, this is obviously a different age bracket, but I think, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And keeping children safe from... And they'll bypass it. The kids have this real sense of pride in being able to get around that stuff mm -hmm. and to understand the algorithms. And they, they can because they're smarter than us. Yeah, but listen to Anne Holland's, like, the Children's Commissioner, like... I love listening to her because the reality is governments are focusing on privacy and no one's talking about rice baits approaches. Like Australia is yeah, yeah. terrible at thinking about the right human rights and the rights of children, you know, the human rights, let alone the rights of children. And if you actually took a rights based approach to what children deserve and what they need and how they should exist in the world, you'd really be shifting some of the ways we'd be approaching policy in this country, I reckon. And the same as the voice of kids, they just don't, don't exist in this discourse. And I fail at this. I fail at this in my advocacy. Like I've tried, I went to Reach and was like talking with them saying, I'll, I'll give them a podcast. Like I'll run it, I'll fund it, like I'll do everything because they need to have a louder voice. You know, how, how do we give that to them? How do they, do you know what I mean? It's, it's a really, it's a, this obvious missing thing. And health services are horrible at it. We're just going to take one, one more, yeah. Yeah, g'day. I wanted to talk about the idea of the passive versus active consumption 
Um, I mean, consumption, again, we're talking about screen time as a dead concept. Uh, but is there a best way to integrate the use of active like screen time use to like better connect with your children in that way? Do you guys find good strategies in your work? Oh. Well, you, you can't think of a better one than yours. Like that's, this is, a, you know, we meet these kids. So the, the, what people used to say was language development, screens, bad for speech development. You know, people used to say that. The increased screen time means kids won't talk as much. But actually what we know about brain development is that communication in any form enriches the development of that part of your brain. And you've lived that. And I think that's actually a really important thing, what you just said, because communication is so much more than speech anyway. Mm -hmm. And I work with a lot of children that are without verbal communication. Um, and I, I get these families when they're at their most vulnerable state. And I literally was, uh, I have been so privileged to support a family over the last few years um, where this little boy, he is, he, he actually has a few words now, and it's actually the device which has actually helped to encourage that level of communication. But I was privileged enough to be there the first time he used the LAMP program, and um, in conjunction with his mum, and obviously it was, uh, it's built to grow with the child as the child's development grows as well. But he can sit now for snack and he can point and press it and the speech device will talk to him and tell him what he has. And we were actually all crying because for the first time, his mum um, actually knew exactly what her child wanted to say. And I, I, I think it, it would be remiss to say that we shouldn't have that level of device. Um, and, and, you know... It, it does, it plays an integral part. And, and I think, you know, I have two children in specialist education and, and there's a lot of children that don't have the luxury of um, voice word. If we were to take the device out of their um, equation completely, well then where is their, vi their voice? How do they um, learn to advocate for themselves? But, and but so as, a, sorry, you know, you yeah, as a generic example, like just shared screen time, like shared, <laughs> shared media time, um, I have so many parents coming up to me at times going, what is this Minecraft thing? How does that, like, mm. it's not, I'm just like, play a game with your child. Mm. If your child has an interest in that, if they had an interest in swimming, you would take an interest in swimming. Like, if they have an interest in Fortnite, sit down and play it. And I wasn't going to tell a story, but the story is, as I was leaving home and I was talking to my 10-year-old and my wife, my 10-year-old and wife had been talking in the drive on the way home in the car about whether or not they should play Stardew Valley together. Great little indie game, excellent game around farming and doing all this rest of stuff. And my wife was like, I can probably spend half an hour playing Stardew Valley with you and we can do that. And my 10 year old son was like, yeah, but you do have work to do. So maybe you should actually be Is doing your work. So it's like, like <laughs> it's so, it's so much more nuanced and it's so much more complex. But, and, and people don't play with their children on computers because it's like, oh, it's screens, it's all bad and all the rest. It's like, no. It's a place where relationships can happen, right? Yeah, I agree yeah. with that, actually. So my eldest son, um, like the child that you were talking about before, he really struggles. He could sit here and have a, a conversation with any of you adults, but can't actually sit in a room and have a conversation appropriately with another uh, one of his peers. And yet he can game online with his mates, and I hear the dialogue, and I hear them laughing, and I hear them having a beautiful time. If I was to take that away from him, where would that leave him? And he has ment mental health. so. Yeah, it's a really, it's a... Yeah, but it's, it's a good <laughs> nuance of even that, the active and passive yeah. use, because I think there's, we're, we can't pretend that passive use doesn't happen that is, you know, not helping kids, you know what I mean? As in they're anxious and they're passively scrolling. Mm -hmm. And that's, a lot of the stuff is designed like that. There's no chapters on things because you never have to go, do I want to keep doing this? Yeah because it's endless. So there's no decision-making component. You just stay actively involved. But we can also think about how do some of the passive things, how do we bring them and make them active? How do we explore that with our kids? You know, like Spider-Man has been amazing for my daughter and building her self-esteem. And now there's this whole narrative that exists. We do this thing where she jumps on all the couches and does all this and she's being Spider-Man. I just cannot convince her that she's ghost. Because she's like, no, no, I'm, I'm Spidey. And she's like doing all this stuff because there's just no female superheroes. It drives me crazy. But, you know, like, so how do I help her with those narratives? But it's the same as all the kids. It's the same as I had a kid, another kid ages ago that I was really into ant farms and autistic, didn't have any friends, social connection, not interested in them and all that stuff. 
I couldn't for years I couldn't have a conversation with him because he was doing okay so I was only seeing him every six months and I used to feel crap every time he'd come in and I'd never get anything out of him so I got into there's this YouTuber who like just has his whole garage set up with ant farms and you'll see him he's got a huge following and then I got started getting caught up in it and I was like I got so much other stuff to do but I was watching these videos <laughs> but it gave me this beautiful way to connect with him and I think if parents look at what their kids are doing and saying especially the teenagers you've got to do it so gently because they're their spidey senses are pretty high for like mum's trying to form connection here or dad's trying, you know. Mm. But how do we think about that? How do we explore? How do we understand how they feel about it? Because then you're more likely, if they're being bullied, they've seen horrific content, anything like that, that they're going to feel safe coming to you. Yeah. And our kids feeling safe coming to us is the most important thing of everything that we're doing. Like, and there's a vulnerability on screens because we can't see it. We're not watching them, you know, and just how do we... Yeah, how do we bring everyone in to understand that so much of the stuff that might be seen as passive can be active and explore that? And yeah, and it's yeah, it's a hard thing. M- Mum's often think in clinic that my job is to do all the food and everything. Dad, dad's the fun one, and it's you know it's a pretty outdated mindset. But you know, and yeah, people might know there's an amazing game called It Takes Two. Like if you yeah. play Dash, yeah, but it's a beautiful like game that is all about partnership and all that stuff. It's a beautiful narrative through it. And yeah, like how do you look at those opportunities and explore that stuff and just think about how your kid's going, I think is the important bit. I'm going to jump in here because we are a little over time and I'm committed to the idea of snacks and drinks to follow this. So we're going to press pause here, but it is a pause. You will, we will have a, an opportunity to continue these conversations um, in a moment. I want you to join me first in thanking our um, panellists for coming and being part of this conversation. And now I'm going to invite um, Julian Sefton Green, who's one of our CIs in the centre, to come and do the very easy job of summarising uh, what has been actually quite a wide ranging conversation. So if you'd like to leave us with a few thoughts. I've got three little points I'll try to make. Uh, but first of all, a real shout out, Kate, for bringing this panel together. And thank you very much to the panel. <clears throat> So the first point I want to try to make is around um, what I think of as a sort of language deficit. So you've all in different ways throughout the way you've talked tonight tried to find single words to describe a complex set of relationships and negotiations as you play with your kids, um, as you engage with the media. And you, I've used words like share. Um, Billy, you were hot on sharing particularly, but I don't want to pick on people. Um, some people were keen on interacting. You just ended up talking about play, be, playing together. Um, there's a sort of whole thing about walking alongside, about joint, doing things together. You couldn't find, and this isn't a criticism, right? it doesn't exist, um, that you couldn't find, we can't find single terms, single expressions to express the warmth and the cuddliness of when you're sitting with, playing with a kid together on media, which is kind of, so doing stuff with kids on media is often a long drawn out process that is warm and um, affective emotional, uh, it's tactile often, uh, really, right? So um, the idea of screen time is a cold world, right? When you think of screen time, you think of a child watching a screen. You can't get between what the child is seeing on the screen. You're outside, you're looking in, you're excluded. You've just, you've consistently, all of you in different ways, talked positively about the, the actual media experiences are completely the reverse of being on the outside. You, you, you're on the inside is what's positive. Time is about as cold as it gets, right? So we live in a, so that we don't have an, a competitive vocabulary or a range of language to give confidence both politically, socially, interpersonally, in clinic, in the situations which you know all about and I don't. Um, that can give strength and succor to the pe- to people that need it because we're like it's that we're being locked away, we're being kept out in a cold, nasty world, right? Second point I want to make: um, one of my colleagues here, Andy, um, was involved in a project looking at um, parenting during the pandemic, and one of the counterintuitive findings for all the people that moaned about having to spend their time. Um, looking, watch, making their kids do homework on a computer and things like that. One of the paradoxes that happened was loads of parents started to have to spend time with their kids because they couldn't go to work, and they started to enjoy and learn from what their kids were doing and what this stupid word or rep bundle of words, media consumption or something stupid academic and everything, the whole sort of process of doing stuff together with the involved some media thing. And the parents, the pandemic helped parents 
learned to see what was going on. So they stopped thinking what they ought to do. They stopped worried about what they could do because you couldn't do anything anyway. And they just learned from the experiences of watching the kids interact, play, enjoy, do things together, whatever these bundle of words is that we don't have a single term for. So it seems to take a pandemic to make people come to their senses uh, to look at how to engage and work with and really understand what's at stake when we talk about kids and media in the home. And then the third point I want to make, and it goes back to Dan's opening point about the sort of privilege of us being here in, in this way, is just how um, um, totally in step what you guys have said so brilliantly about uh, uh, sensible, matter of fact, everyday media experiences, how in step you are with millions of people all over the, the country, and how completely out of step you are with anything else that um, people in my position get invited to talk about. Right, so two weeks ago I was at the New South Wales Premier's Social Media Summit or something, right? It's, we all might have a very common shared understanding in this room, and you guys are the best at this and have made a lovely case for it, but the question I'm left with, if we have this kind of language deficit, if there is a sort of absence of a vocabulary to kind of describe what we're doing, if um, people are feeling, you know, the pressure and we are out of step, what the, the problem is, why, what is, what, what, who, who is gaining from promoting the alternative kind of norms? What's at stake with the discourse of screen time? What's, why is it so popular? Why are politicians pursuing the most bizarre kind of and unlikely policies, particularly in this country, um, where there's nothing, anyway, particularly in this country, uh, what, what, what's, what, what's, what's so powerful about this counter-narrative if what you're saying is so straightforward, and which I personally believe, don't get me wrong, and I think it's something to do with the, lang the power of language that we don't have, um, going right back to somebody said at the very beginning, a way of describing childhood in the modern world. We just don't have sensible, common sense words that everybody is perfectly happy with um, that explain what it is like to grow up amidst media technologies. So that's my three penny worth, as it were. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll leave it uh, there. Please join us for a drink, a snack, uh, and some more conversation.